Okay, thank you, Dr. Chow. Good morning, everyone. Today I'll be discussing a core curriculum topic on chamber quantification. The objectives of today's talk will be to explain a little bit about how we pick normative data for our equiparameters and where it comes from, and also how we um, assign severity cutoffs for equiparameters. We'll go over the principles and pitfalls of chamber quantification. One of the things that I will not cover, uh, although it is included in the relevant guidelines, is strain. Uh, and that's because it is a, a topic on its own and will likely be presented uh, later in the year. So the two main guidelines that I will be referring to over the course of the talk is the Chamber uh, Quantification Guideline by the American Society of Echocardiography, published in 2015. And then I will reference a little bit the Comprehensive Transthoracic Echo in Adults Guideline published in 2019 uh, for certain uh, parts of the talk. So echo is uh, a game of numbers, of course, with some uh, fuzzy uh, gray, uh, white and black images. Um, and it's, it's important for us to understand where the numbers that we so heavily rely on when reporting actually come from. Now, there are different ways that we can establish normal and abnormal uh, parameters for, for many different things in medicine. In the case of ECHO, we have sort of three options. Uh, one is to pick a healthy population, uh, obtain a bunch of values in that healthy population, then get a mean and standard deviations. And then based on standard deviations, we can somewhat arbitrarily say, okay, if you are greater than two standard deviations above this norm, then you maybe have some mild dilation. If you're three standard deviations over, you have moderate, and so on and so forth. Now, the benefit of going about it in this fashion is that we actually have quite a bit of data in the echo literature to do this. However, uh, many echo parameters are not distributed in a Gaussian normal fashion. So that's a, a limitation of this method. To overcome that, what we can do, oops, skip the slide, is take a population of both healthy adults as well as those with uh, various disease states, create percentiles for the measurement, um, and then overcome the, the sort of the lack of symmetry in the distribution. Unfortunately, although we have a lot of data for normal, in normal healthy patients, we don't for, for various disease states, so we can't really base our, our normative and abnormal values uh, in this fashion. Another potential way to go about establishing uh, normals and abnormals is to look at outcomes and prognosis. Um, as clinicians, most of us would like this approach, uh, but unfortunately, we don't have prognostic uh, or outcome data for a lot of echo parameters, with the exception of the left atrial volume. There's also the challenge of how we, of defining risk. For example, even with left atrial volume, if we have an elevated volume in an athlete, that carries a different risk than when we see the same pathology in someone with atrial fibrillation, for example. So now that we've gone over exactly how um, what the possibilities are for establishing these values, how is it actually done in the ASC guidelines that I will be referring to throughout the course of the talk? Well, basically the, the guideline looked at seven databases. All the values they collected were based on non-contrast echoes. They collected age, gender, ethnicity, height, and weight for the patients. So that way they were able to establish standard deviations for age, gender, and BSA. For many of the parameters. None of the, the patients were generally felt to be hopefully a healthy representative group. Uh, none of them had hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia. They were of normal BMI and creatinine. And all of the values that you'll see presented throughout the talk, with the exception of LV size, mass, EF, and LA volume, are presented as a mean plus minus two standard deviations. On top of that, in the, in the case of those values that are the exception, the group has chosen to come up with sort of an expert opinion, consensus-based 
uh, partition for mild, moderate, and severely abnormal. So we'll get right off uh, and started uh, on how we make measurements. So the first thing to add before you obtain any measurements is, is to obtain a nice view of where you will be making those measurements. In the case of the parasternal long axis, we want to make sure that our sort of heart is centered and no, not seeing the apex is normal. And then very importantly, we want to try and not see any pap muscles in this view. And I'll show you later on why that is of such uh, importance. So once we've obtained this view, we next want to identify end systole and end diastole. The ECG is really a guideline for the rough spot where, you're, where you will find those phases, but the way we define end diastole and systole is through mechanical events. So in the case of end diastole, we want to take the first frame after the mitral valve closes, and in the case of end systole, we basically want to look at the chamber of interest and find its smallest or biggest, depending on what we're measuring, in this case, smallest uh, size. Um, once we've identified those phases, we can then start making some measurements. For end diastole, we make the measurement for our intraventricular septal thickness, the LV internal uh, dimension in diastole and the uh, posterior wall thickness. Uh, where do we kind of decide where to take this measurement? Well, basically we want to be perpendicular to the long axis of the LV when we make the measurement, and we want to be just below the mitral uh, leaflet tips. When we do our wall thickness measurements, we want to just take the compacted myocardium and not so much any little trabeculae, and not, you know, the pericardium itself. In the end systolic view, we just do one measurement, uh, and that's the LV uh, internal dimension in systole. I will talk about this number four up here later in the talk. Okay, so what are some pitfalls uh, when we make the internal uh, dimension measurement for the LV? In order to obtain the maximal dimension, we ideally need to be in this plane when we're in that parasternal long axis view. Now, we don't know when we're in the parasternal long axis view that we are indeed here. If we don't see pap muscles, we can say that we're probably there. And so that's kind of what we would see on our parasternal long axis. Now, this technique of um, what we're showing you here is something called on Phillips the X plane. So essentially, you can obtain this view and then get a 90 degree orthogonal view, um, which is this one, and then you can make your measurements. That's the only really sure way that you know you're in the right spot, but we don't typically do this on a day to day basis. If you obtain a parasternal long axis view and instead you see something like this, where some of the pap muscle and cords are coming in, and explain that, you may realize that you're actually measuring along here, and that would not be the greatest, uh, the largest dimension. So we'll now move on to talk about LV mass. There are a number of different methods to calculating LV mass that the ASC Chamber Quantification Guideline uh, discusses. The one that I will show you here is the linear method. It's the one that is most commonly used. Uh, because it's simple. Uh, the, there is a 2D and a 3D way of, of estimating LV mass. Um, with the, It's more cumbersome and there's less normative data available for those methods. In the linear method, what we do is we, the measurements we just spoke about, we essentially plug them into the LV mass equation. So you can see the thickness is here and then the LV, here it's called uh, and diastolic dimension, but it's the same internal dimension we talked about. Once you obtain your mass, you will also calculate the relative wall thickness, which will help you decide which uh, type of uh, hypertrophy you're dealing with. So for example, if your um, mass is 120 in a male 
and your uh, relative wall thickness is greater than 4.2, that will place that, place that patient in the concentric hypertrophy realm. Now, one important uh, assumption that we make in using this um, method of LV mass uh, calculation is that the LV is elliptoid in shape. Of course, as you know, patients um, develop cardiomyopathies, they will dilate and not be elliptoid, be more a little, a bit spherical. And of course, there are other pathologies where we don't get uniform LV hypertrophy, but rather have asymmetry in the hypertrophy. That can happen with HCM. It can also happen if, for example, you had a big LAD infarct and you're left with a very thin wall in that region. So those are the limitations in accuracy of this method. One important pitfall to be mindful of because it, it comes up fairly uh, often is this sigmoid septum business. So as we age, our uh, uh, thorax kind of scrunches in and it's thought that that's what leads to this uh, proximal part of the basal portion of your, of your septum kind of bulging out while the rest of the, the wall is fairly normal in its thickness. So when we encounter this issue, the correct way, according to the guidelines of making measurements, is to sort of skip that section and measure below it, instead of doing this where we measure the with, within that area. And the reason being that we'll get quite different uh, values and, and our mass will then be sort of falsely elevated uh, once we plug it into that equation that I just spoke about. We'll now move on to LV volumes. We obtain LV volumes in the apical views, uh, namely the apical four chamber and the apical two chamber. And once again, before we start making measurements, we first want to obtain the most optimal view. And in the case of the, the LV volumes, it's really a matter of making sure that we're not foreshortened. For the C1s um, uh, listening today, I will show you a picture of what foreshortening is so that you kind of get a sense of what we're talking about because we talk about it a lot. And when we're doing the measurements, we actually want to zoom in on the LV uh, as shown uh, here. So the model that we use to obtain volumes is called the biplane disc model. What this entails is you obtain an apical four and apical two chamber view first in end diastole, and then you will trace the compacted myocardium all the way around and around and around until you get to the other side of the annulus. You release your cursor. The cursor will then, the computer will then complete the loop and also slice up your LV uh, into 20 discs. And it does that for both of the views. Once you have these 20 discs, you've essentially, um, you have little cylinders that are making up the LV, and you can calculate the volume of each of those cylinders using the equation demonstrated here. That equation relies on uh, knowing the length of the cylinder. The length of the cylinder is simply this line here divided by 20, as well as the diameter in, which is, this diameter in uh, the apical four chamber and the D2 diameter, which is the diameter in the apical two chamber. Once we have the volume for each of the discs, they're summed up. This all happens in the background, of course, and we obtain an end diastolic volume. We repeat the same steps and obtain an end systolic volume, and then we can plug in uh, those values into the equation shown here uh, to. Um, get an LVEF. The guidelines recommend uh, using this method or a 3D method of obtaining an LVEF. We no longer recommend using linear measurements uh, to obtain LVEFs because of, there are more, when you use the linear measure, measurements, there are more assumptions that you're making about the LV geometry. All right, so pitfalls. Oh, wow. Oh. I, I think someone's not muted. That was um, me. Oh, yeah. No worries. Uh, so what do we mean by foreshortening? So when we obtain ideal views of the uh, LV, we see that the apex is nice and kind of 
not pointy like a, you know, super pointy, but nice rounded pointy. So we know that we're kind of at the end of the apex. And then when we go from end diastole to end systole, we see that that apex level stays level. It doesn't move down because that's not how the LV, it doesn't really move in that direction physiologically. However, if you get a view of your LV and you're cutting off a bit of that apex, then what you might end up doing is actually tracing lower down than the true apex, obtaining a much lower volume. You will also notice that when you go from end systole to end diastole, you're going to end up with a bit of a stumpy looking LV, and again, without obtaining that true apex in your tracing. So starting off with a nice um, quality image is key. The other important thing is how we trace. So when when we when I was a C1, you know, you when you start all this off, you think what you're tracing is the interface between the blood and the myocardium. But in fact, what you're tracing is the interface between the compacted and non-compacted myocardium. So what we want to um, trace kind of around is all these little trabeculae, including as well the pap muscle shown here. And that way you'll obtain an accurate tracing. Now, what happens when, you know, let's say that there's a lot of dropout here and you can't really see the endocardium very well to do a reasonable tracing? We'll come back to that. What you can do is use ultrasound enhancing agent, or what we frequently refer to as affinity contrast. Affinity contrast, for those of you who don't have much experience with it, is not a uh, contrast like we use in CT. It's simply a kind of a li lipid uh, microbubbles of um, uh, octofluoropropane gas that dissipates within a minute or so after it's injected in the patient. And that helps us obtain these pictures where they do nicely delineate um, the, the border that we're supposed to then trace. Now, um, there is a whole other separate guideline uh, published by the ASC in 2018 on contrast, when we use it, uh, troubleshooting with it, because this, what you're seeing here, is a very ideal um, picture, and it doesn't always turn out that way. And there are um, uh, sort of limitations and things you have to consider when you're injecting, how much you're injecting, how you prepare it. I won't get into that now because I suspect we'll cover that topic again. But just to summarize, if you see more than two contiguous segments that are poorly visualized, that will limit your ability to trace and that the guidelines recommend that you at that point proceed to using contrast. An important thing to remember is that when we use contrast, our upper limits of normal for the volumes are actually higher. So you can't use the chamber quantification 2015 guidelines, which are um, which which sort of publish a different set of non-contrast numbers. You have to remember to use these uh, limits. We, we also have the option of using 3D volumes. In our lab, we typically try and do this for our cardio-oncology cases because there is data to support uh, uh, its use in that population. Um, the beautiful part about 3D volumes is that they don't make any um, geometric assumptions and they're less affected by uh, apical foreshortening. Uh, they're quite uh, reproducible between studies and have uh, been correlated uh, well to MRI, although the volumes are still different than what we get on MRI and they're slightly smaller. Um, they do require uh, that you have reasonable image quality before you can actually use the 3D software on your uh, like vendor's machine. Um, they're not as popular in use simply because we don't have as much published data on uh, normal values and the use of the, this technique in disease states. However, the guideline does um, believe that there's enough evidence for us to uh, include upper limits of normal in the guideline. And if your lab has the 
expertise to use this technique, it is recommended. So this is a summary uh, table of all things LV uh, included in the supplement of the uh, guideline. One of the things to just again remind you of is that the normal range is simply a mean plus minus two standard deviations. All of these mildly, moderately, and severely abnormal values that you see listed here are expert opinion. Um, and the purpose of them being published despite expert opinion is that we want consistency between um, labs when we're doing our report. We'll now switch gears to the left atrium. So the size of the left atrium um, reflects kind of the chronic filling pressure situation in the LA. If you have a normal LA size, then you can say, well, there's no chronic filling pressure elevation. What's the filling pressure right now? We don't really know. If you have a dilated LA, you can say that there is chronic pressure elevation, but once again, we cannot say the current filling pressures are. We estimate current filling pressures based on Doppler findings, some of which were discussed by Daniel at last week's uh, ECHO rounds. I like this picture because it really um, kind of uh, gives a pictorial view of this concept. On a 2D image, you can have both of these atria look more or less the same size, but they actually have different pressures. And then you can also have these two atria looking quite different in size, but they have very similar filling pressures. We estimate uh, LA size by LA volume. An important concept to be mindful of is that the long axis of the LV is different from the long axis of the LA. So if you obtain a nice image of your LV, you will always have a foreshortened uh, LA. So what we have to do is obtain a dedicated zoomed in view of the LA and then proceed with tracing at end systole. That is when the left atrium will be its fullest. We, when we trace, we exclude um, pulmonary veins, which you will see coming in kind of along here. We also exclude the left atrial appendage. And our tracings should not encompass the leaflet tips. We should stop at the annulus uh, when tracing. We do these tracings both in the apical four and apical two chamber, and then can use the biplane disc method to calculate a volume. An alternative way of calculating volume is the area length technique. Both are acceptable in the guidelines, where we just trace an area and then place a length uh, measurement down, and then use a different equation to create to get a volume. What is not recommended any longer is simply using this LA dimension as a measure of size. Because even if you have dilatation of the LA in this plane, since the LA is not symmetric, it may not, it doesn't really give you a true sense of, of size. We do still make this measurement in the lab um, because we may not be able to get an LA volume and, and it's something, um, and it is still used in research studies. Uh, to make a measurement in this plane, you want to basically be uh, along the sinotubular, um, sort of along the uh, sinotubular uh, part of the aorta, and then go perpendicular down to the other side of the LA. These are the um, normal uh, values for males and females, and then the uh, partition values for, for severity. Unlike most of the other values that are reported in the guideline, the left atrial volume does have some prognostic data, um, and so these are less expert-based cutoffs. The RA volume is obtained in a very similar fashion, uh, but we only obtain it in the apical four chamber view, and the cutoffs are listed here. I'll now go over the LVOT. So you may not know why we, uh, if you're new to ECHO, why we need uh, an LVOT measurement, which is shown here uh, as number one. <laughs> the reason is that we can obtain a stroke volume uh, estimate by incorporating this measurement into another equation. We also need this measurement for calculating things like 
the um, aortic valve area. That's all obviously very important in uh, aortic stenosis. In order to make this measurement accurately, we obtain a zoomed in view of the LVOT when we're perpendicular to sort of the ascending aorta. We do the measurement in mid systole. It's an inner edge. So the inner edge is this part of the, um, of the image to inner edge, which is the start of the white on the other side. We want to take the image according to this sort of the 2019 um, comprehensive uh, echo guidelines in an adult, about three to 10 millimeters from the valve plane. And just to be mindful, when you're then later in other views doing PW measurements um, or PW Doppler, you kind of want to make try to place the cursor in roughly the same area. So what is this number two here? Well, this is the aortic valve annular diameter. This is a virtual kind of measurement. It, it's essentially the measurement just below the aortic valve cusps. It's important for surgical planning uh, when, when we're having TAVI and, and valve replacements. However, it's very difficult to actually obtain this um, measurement accurately with 2D, uh, to, with transthoracic echo. Oh, I'm having a little lag in my, uh, in my slide uh, skips, so sorry about that. Uh, so why is it so difficult? Well, again, it's similar to the when we were looking at the LV, we don't actually know very well that the measurement we're taking in this view is indeed straight through the middle of the valve. We may actually be more here. A trick to use to, to kind of have a sense that you may be off center is if your closure line is not in the middle, but rather eccentric. Nonetheless, most of the time we simply rely on CT for this measurement and don't, uh, don't measure it by, by uh, transthoracic echo. The measurements that we do uh, rely on uh, and that are repeated often uh, with, for our patients is the aortic root and ascending aorta. The, these measurements you will do in end diastole and it will be leading edge to leading edge. So that means you start at the top of the, the white, if you will, and you go down to the, to the, to the bottom uh, top of the white kind of thing. The aortic root is measured at the sinotubular uh, level right over here. Uh, sorry, the sinus of Alsalva over here. And then you can measure the sinotubular junction. We often don't. We sit in our lab, we simply take this one. And then you do the ascending aorta by going up one intercostal space from this view. The normal uh, values are shown here for children and adolescents, younger adults, and adults over 40. You can also obtain them by, or index them by body surface area. Indexing to body surface area is of particular importance if you're at the extremes of normals uh, in height. We'll now move on to talk about the RV. The RV. Um, is assessed from a RV focused apical chamber view for the most part. So from the routine apical four chamber, we sort of go a little more lateral to bring uh, out the RV uh, in its longest kind of length. The RV modified uh, apical chamber view just is sort of, there's a bit of a rotation to it and it gives us the RV free wall um, kind of in more focus so that we can get obtain an, R, an RV thickness from that view. Now, we make a lot of RV linear measurements, um, but there it, we still rely on kind of the eyeball method to uh, as well. And, and what that means is normally your RV is smaller than your LV and it's not apex forming. So if at some point you start to see that the RV is starting to encroach on the apex, we sort of say, oh, maybe there's some mild dilatation. If the RV and the LV look about the same size and share the apex, we say that's moderate uh, dilatation of the RV. 
and if the RV is actually bigger and now the apex uh, takes over the apex, that's severely dilated. The guidelines recommend that we use quantitative and qualitative data when we're making our judgment calls about the RV. In our lab, uh, for the RV inflow, the value that we measure is the basal RV diameter. That is obtained in the RV focused apical chamber for apical four chamber view. And the normal values range from 25 to 41 millimeters. That's the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. You can also obtain a mid um, diameter as well. There's an, a, a quite a bit of data for the inflow view, um, measurements. There's less data for the outflow uh, measurements. Uh, the, for the RV outflow, proximally, we go from the anterior wall down to the sort of uh, atrial septal junction. And in the parasternal short axis, we can do a similar measurement along with a distal RVOT measurement. Now, these measurements we do in end diastole. The exception is if you are trying to calculate the RVOT stroke volume, then you would have to take the measurements in mid systole. For RV wall thickness, we go to that RV modified apical four chamber, we're at end diastole, and we make our measurements kind of at the level of where you would expect the tricuspid tips, uh, tricuspid valve tips to be when they're open. Um, and the normals are shown here. As you recall, the RV is a very sensitive, is sensitive to afterload. So even in things like pulmonary hypertension, where you expect to see um, RV wall thickening, the, one of the earlier signs will still be RV dilatation. We'll now switch over to our last quantification for the day, and that's the RV systolic function. We first have to talk a little bit about the physiology um, and mechanics of, I guess, RV systolic function before getting to the measurements, just so that they make sense to us. So many of us know that the myocardial contractility, venous return, and pulmonary vascular resistance obviously impact the systolic function. But one of the things we don't think as much about is the interventricular septal contraction and the effect it can have on, on RV systolic function, as well as pericardial compliance. Another important thing to be mindful of that's different from the LV is the direction, the predominant rather orientation of the myocardial fibers. In the RV, it tends, they tend to be along the longitudinal plane and less so in the transverse plane, which is more in keeping with what the LV is doing. So effectively, most of our systolic motion uh, for the RV is the base moving down towards the apex. And that's why some of our um, measurements or estimation of RV systolic function is based on longitudinal systolic function. So we extrapolate these values, which are, as, you'll, as I'll explain, basically looking at the base of that RV. And then we say, okay, probably the rest of the RV is functioning in this fashion. So what are these longitudinal uh, systolic function parameters? One of them is called TAPSI, uh, stands for tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. The normal uh, or rather abnormal value is a TAPSI less than 17 millimeters. Uh, this value has prognostic utility. And what it entails is we put a cursor over the, just below the, the tricuspid uh, annulus laterally. We then go into something called M mode. And from that M mode, we can see the distance that is um, transversed uh, during systole. Similarly, we can measure the velocity of that spot of my myocardial tissue using something called tissue Doppler and obtaining a velocity of less than 9.5. So that's this S signifies uh, systolic tissue velocity. Uh, less than 9.5 is indicative of RV systolic dysfunction. It too is a prognostic um, marker. Now, how do these longitud longitudinal uh, systolic function markers uh, correlate to global RVEF? 
if we look at studies that um, compared these parameters to RVEF by radionuclide uh, tests, their correlation is, according to the guidelines, pretty good. However, if we look at more recently published literature and uh, compare those longitudinal uh, markers to cardiac MRI-derived RVEF, the correlation is not quite that good. So in this meta-analysis, it was 0.4. The idea here is that you can kind of fake um, a TAPSI. So if your LV function is still preserved and your LV makes up most of the apex, when it contracts, it will sort of pull uh, on the RV and kind of pull it, pull that base a little more apically, giving you the pseudo, sort of a pseudo normalization of TAPSI. So that's a limitation to be mindful of. So now with that limitation, we want to kind of look more at global systolic function. And one of the things that we can look at is something called the RV index of myocardial performance. It is not commonly used, but it is discussed in the guidelines, so I'll go over it. In this cartoon picture, what you see up top is in diastole, we have tricuspid flow, okay? Then the tricuspid valve closes. It remains closed for systole. It opens once again when systole is over, and then there's flow again. Over in the bottom area, we're looking at the RVOT. So when the tricuspid valve closes, we have intraventricular, sorry, isovolumetric uh, contraction. Then the pulmonic valve opens. We have flow through our RVOT. That's the ejection time. And then once, um, the pulmonic valve closes, and before the tricuspid valve opens again, we have the isovolumetric relaxation time. If your RV is functioning poorly, you will have lengthening of the isovolumetric times and shortening of the ejection time, such that your RIMP will go up. The way we obtain those times by echo is one of two ways, either using PW across the tricuspid to obtain the tricuspid closure to opening time or the and the uh, RVOT where we obtain the ejection time and then we plug it in to this formula. Or we use tissue Doppler and obtain both the ejection time and the th these other times in this in one kind of go. We used to think that the, this parameter was not load dependent. However, more recent sort of uh, literature has shown that that's not to be not not the case, and it sort of makes hemodynamic sense because if you picture a very elevated right atrial pressure, you're going to end up opening your tricuspid valve sooner, such that your inter uh, isovolumetric relaxation time shrinks, and you ultimately get some pseudo normalization of this RIMP. The guidelines recommend that you can use this parameter, but it's that it not be the only parameter you use for evaluation of RV systolic function. One of the other ways that we can estimate RV global systolic function is by calculating the fractional area change, which is essentially the percent change in RV area. The, this measure does correlate with cardiac MRI, but there is quite a bit of inter observer reproducibility issues because we all trace a little bit differently. There's also the challenge that we can't really longitudinally track this FAC very well because every time we do an echo, we probably get a slightly different slice uh, or window than the previous time. However, uh, it is a prognostic value and the cutoff is uh, 35% for less than 35% being abnormal. And lastly, one of the sort of up and coming ways of evaluating the RV function is through 3D LVEF. The upper limits for the volumes are shown here, and the cutoff for the EF itself is 45%. There is excellent correlation between the RVEF and cardiac MRI. However, there are limitations. Um, you can, most of the time when we're interested in what the RV is doing, it's often going hand in hand with some 
um, functional TR. And if the RV has sort of a pop-off valve, um, then it can look like it's functioning quite well. But once you fix that valve, it'll the RV can go quite uh, quite bad and look bad. One of the, the potential roles where we think RV 3D EF will be very useful is in the setting of uh, post-pericardiotomy patients, where really those linear measurements that we, or longitudinal measurements that we, the TAPSI, for example, that we spoke about earlier, do not correlate well at all with function. Why do we not use this more? Um, it is a new technique. It takes some time to learn. It, your, your vendor has to have the software on the machine. And on top of that, we don't still have um, quite robust data uh, in disease states uh, for this uh, way of um, measuring EF. All right, we have made it through the uh, talk here. Uh, so just some conclusions. Uh, remember that normative values for echo parameters are based on the mean plus minus two standard deviations in a healthy population. The severity partitions that we um, rely heavily on are for the most part expert opinion. Uh, there are numerous pitfalls when we're making measurements and obtaining uh, excellent pictures to start and then being mindful of those pitfalls is very important. And possibly in the future, we may see more um, 3D echo uh, replacing some of, these, uh, some of these linear and 2D measurements. Thank you. Thank I'll you. Take any questions. Um, yeah, thank you, Vasna, for giving us uh, such a comprehensive and also very important fundamental review of what we do every day. So um, now we can open for discussion. Maybe I'll just start off with a couple of comments. I, I wrote it in the chat uh, as we move along in case I forget. Uh, one of them is um, the um, when, you, when you do um, echo contrast and when you try to trace the myocardium, please flash the myocardium to get rid of the myocardial contrast before uh, before you take the picture, it will make our life a lot easier and in terms of tracing because it makes the uh, contrast to endocardial border much more obvious. Because like, you know, when you when you mix up the contrast in the myocardium, it decreases the, you know, the signal to noise um, type of situation. The other big thing that uh, I think, you know, Vesna is um, uh, worth bringing up again. Would you mind just going back to the slide where you do the uh, aortic uh, analysis and LVOT? This is our yes. eternal discussion that's been going on ever since I moved to uh, St. Michael's Hospital like two decades ago. <laughs> it went back and forth, back and forth. So we we initially, when I first arrived, we measured at number two for our LVOT. Uh, and then like, uh, this is a like really long time ago. And then with the chamber quantification guideline in 2005, we moved it to number one. And uh, so we moved it back up about three to, um, you know, uh, three to uh, seven or eight uh, millimeter uh, that you described, you know, up to 10. Uh, and uh, that's sort of like the concept of um, measuring exactly where we do the PW for the LVOT. So we've done that for a long while. And then in the last year or so, we've actually moved it back to two uh, in our um, uh, ICAO round or our um, accreditation round. There's a number of reasons for that. It's, um, I think uh, Howard is a big proponent on this. I'll let him expand on this, but um, some of it is actually the, uh, it's more reliable because it's less arbitrary uh, in number two position. And also uh, in that place, it's more rounded. As long as you line it up, as you said in the next slide, I'll let Howard jump in because this is his pet peeve thing. Uh, thanks, Chi Ming. Um, I'll, I'll comment first on the contrast, um, the, the use of the flash. I agree with you completely. Um, and I see that we've 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 changed a little bit to add a few tweaks in the protocol. So I think a number of the sonographers are um, uh, getting uh, initial shots of the RV with the first injection on the four chamber, which I which I actually do like because you can actually get a, a reasonable assessment of RV cell function before um, the concentration gets so high that the RV just completely blooms out. Um, and then the second shot uh, of the LV before the microbubbles get into the myocardium. So the, 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 the myocardium is relatively dark early on, uh, but once the, the contrast circulates through the myocardium, it gets bright because it permeates the capillaries within the myocardium. And as Chi Ming said, uh, 
you don't get that nice black white interface between the myocardium and the um, and the cavity and then using the flash really helps so you know, if you if you're capturing the contrast um, images for the LV with the apical four and two you know look for a nice darker or dark myocardium ideally and if, if you don't see it then please use the flash um, and this the second thing with the um, the you know I have gone back and forth a little bit with the LV dimension so the I can tell you that the, the 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 updated chamber quantification guidelines will probably use number two inner edge to inner edge at the base of the aortic valve cusp. So the the points that Chiming made are are completely accurate with regards to the rationale behind it. And on top of that, there have been a number of studies, um, some of them led by Philippe Pibaro, that um, have used both. Um, uh, the number one and number two. One was a Jack paper that I was one of the reviewers for, that um, that correlated it with uh, with stroke volume uh, and aortic valve measurements uh, based on cardiac CT. So um, I think it's been it's it's been validated, um, even though it doesn't really make physiologic sense in terms of where we sampled the pulse wave uh, Doppler. I think it it corrects a couple of different problems that you have with one. Um, that uh, that um, that allows you to to, um, uh, to to underestimate the valve area. Um, and the last point about um, using one versus two is that we know that the the LVOT is more um, ellipsoid as opposed to round, uh, and number one represents kind of the 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 short height where the the lateral medial diameter is actually greater. So the way I think about it is that number two probably overestimates um, uh, the short height, but it kind of corrects for the fact that we're not catching the true ellipse uh, and we're, we're assuming it's more circular. So thank you. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's one of those things in, in echo world, if you live long enough, we, we go back and forth. This is one of them that went back and forth. And um, any, any other, other comments from our colleagues? Um, I'm sure there's a lot of... Uh, Maybe Chiming is Bob just... Bob, go ahead. Chi Ming, it's Bob. Yes, Bob, go ahead. So just stay, staying, yeah, just staying on the LVOT issue. In the setting of aortic stenosis, this is actually a key measurement uh, in terms of the valve area you get, and also obviously affects the stroke volume. The um, I, I guess what I've seen is when we're following patients with aortic stenosis. Sometimes you'll see that the LVOT measurement that's used for the calculation changes. And I think that's a big problem. Um, I, I think, and you guys can help on this, uh, there is a sense the LVOT doesn't change in size over time. So if we're measuring it differently, it then re results in a different calculation of, of aortic valve area um, and uh, and and may give us a false impression that the uh, aortic stenosis is is changing, uh, especially if the LVOT dimension is smaller, uh, you know, from one study to the next. So, um, you know, for the text and for the readers, you got to look at the LVOT measurement over time to make sure that it's the same, uh, because changing valve area might actually be false uh, just because of um the change in lvot dimension and i think that's pretty common we had one a few weeks ago that looked like the valve was getting a lot worse and in fact it was the lvot measurement that changed that drove everything yeah because it's squared so pi r squared so that that uh, becomes a problem and and i think you know that that's when like where dimensionless index becomes more popular these days so you know year, years and years ago i put that in the calculator uh, the first came out in the echo calculator and people said like, what was that? And like, it became in, like over the years, it becoming more and more popular. And in fact, become more of an integral part of actually how we report um, our, our, our uh, aortic valve stenosis. So I think that's a welcoming addition. But then, um, I mean, when you look at the aortic valve area that changed uh, quite dramatically, but the gradient didn't change very much, then you have to explain it. So often we have to go back and Re, like look back at how they measure the LVOT, where it was measured, because we did change the measurement for, for fellows and residents who are reporting with us. We did change how we measure number one and two within the last 18 months. So 18 months ago, we were measuring at number one, 
and 18 months now later, we, we're measuring, we, or at least for the last year and a half, we've been measuring it at two, somewhere around there. Any other comments? Yeah, maybe just uh, to ask about, uh, maybe just uh, to ask about the uh, aortic measurements and normalization to body surface area. For a while, we were reporting Z scores, and and we stopped doing that. Um, I, I guess the the issue was the surgeons are the key. Uh, sort of recipients of aortic root sizes and the issue is what numbers do they ever use um, in terms of you know and what we're report how we're reporting it any comments on that chi ming um it's my thought <laughs> so, so the reason why is in the 2015 guideline when it first came out um, there was a table that uh, vastner has pointed out and uh, i took that and actually start working on a uh, aortic root index uh, calculator and uh, I, I did, uh, uh, I, I took the graph on the left side, but haven't actually gone around doing the right side. I'm still trying to find programming time to go back to the right side so we can adjust more, more for service area. Right now it's an absolute number. Um, and um, in terms of uh, doing the standard deviation, the, the way I, I took many of these calculations that you use in uh, cardio math or MD math or echo calculators on CSE website it is to take the normal uh, ranges and find out the standard deviation. So uh, we just like, you know, basically it's the number that you measure minus the mean divided by the standard deviation published. So that's how I come up with the uh, mild, moderate, and severe. And I double checked that with Wendy and 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 the authors uh, around that time that they published it. That that was the normative way that they did it because lack of a better way of doing it we, because we do know that the data is actually asymmetric. I, I will fix that, um, hopefully by finding more programming time this summer and then uh, with my team. And, and then the, the other interesting thing is, um, I mean, despite we moved to the absolute number um, uh, that because our surgeons has been using it uh, as the straight cutoff, like the 55 and whatnot. Um, and, but, but, but interestingly, when I start reviewing external lab still, they, they actually been moving more towards the index. So while we actually moved back to absolute number, the, the external labs and many, many community labs are actually moving into index, interestingly. So I think that's one thing I, I would like. I, I, thanks for bringing that up again. I'll, I'll have a conversation with uh, uh, Mark and, and uh, Geraldine because uh, and, and Kim because they are working on the um, uh, aorta clinic and see what would be the best for us to do uh, moving forward. Because now we actually have aorta clinic which focuses in this kind of methods and and we'll try to report it the way that uh, will be beneficial to to them to follow patients. Maybe Kim can make a comment on that too about aorta size, how we should do it. Yeah. It's it's a tough one. Um, so there's a couple of issues there. Obviously, for when we're looking at the aortopathy syndrome, the Z score is absolutely paramount as we use the modified Ghent criteria to determine who might have Marfan's or Marfan's-like syndrome, such as Louis Dietz or you know some of the th thoracic uh, familial thoracic aortic syndromes there. And that is predicated on the Z scores, which is an indexed value. The problem that's coming out with the index values is, of course, as our population uh, changes, and unfortunately we're not getting any taller, but we're getting wider. And um, that means that uh, people who are obese and so on, that the body surface area calculations can may not necessarily reflect what the sort of hemodynamic responses that the order needs to um, respond to, which might then lead to a dissection type syndrome. So there's a lot of back and forth, and it's a long way to say that we don't know what the best way to index it is. Is it body surface area? Is it to, uh, your height? Is it to the height to the power of 1.7? Is it height to the power of 2.7? And so I think over the next little while, we're gonna get a lot more data, but at the moment, um, and that's why Chiming, you know, as, as Chiming absolutely said, you know, when we spoke to Mark and the guys and the surgeons, they're like, well, our criteria for surgical intervention is still based on the absolute value, but we're now seeing that for some of the syndrome diagnoses, it is based on a Z score. So I, there's no right or wrong at the moment. I, I, I think it's going to be one of those things that uh, evolves over time. Um, I think if it's clear that if someone writes query Marfan syndrome for the um, uh, 
for the indication for the study, then it would be helpful to provide a Z score. I think for our routine 80 year old who someone then says, follow ascending aorta and it's 42 millimeters. I, obviously, I don't think it really matters, to be honest, how we index it there. It's not gonna make a clinical uh, assessment. So I think at the moment still probably uh, we can apply our, our our brains to come up with what is the reasonable thing and guide, but but it is going to change over time, um, and there's not much we can do about that. So it's going to be a watch this space. Um, uh, I, I don't know how. Have you heard any more news from from various other groups uh, as to how how you know larger bodies want to report this moving forward? Because we're we're a bit in a flux at the moment, and no one knows what to do, right? Yeah, no, I, I have not, um, and you know, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they'll address this in the in the updated chamber quantification guidelines from the ASC, which I know they're working now um, on that and a few other updates. So, but but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a bit of a black box, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't think we're, what we're doing is wrong. Um, and to be honest, what what you know, at least in the aortic clinic, Geraldine usually and I usually recheck the measurements, and then for most of the Aortopathy syndromes, there's the Marfans have a very nice, you know, it's just another calculator score that prints out all the criteria. And we generally put the numbers in and then tick the boxes and, and use those to look for the major and minor criteria and so on. So it's not a disaster if it's not put in there. It's just something to think about. And particularly for, for those that sitting Royal College exams, et cetera, it is the Z score that is part of the criteria. So it's not just the absolute diameter per se. Uh, and that's obviously driven by Marfans body habitus, which may be particularly tall, but just to point out to everyone, I got lots of people who are five foot zero that have Marfans with fibrillin one gene positive mutation. So it's not all about the, uh, the characteristic uh, criteria there. The, the only other comment I wanted to say about the uh, Simpsons biplane is just to remind everyone, if you really can't see it, don't trace it. Um, that's why IKL have said we can put a visual assessment in, that's fine. I think it is worthwhile to attempt the tracing um, and then often, uh, if you really find you have to uh, make up so many points um, as you're interpolating, then uh, don't use the tracing. Go back to the eyeball, but where possible, uh, let, let's try and, and provide a proper quantitative uh, uh, measure there. I, I think we, we obviously want to do this as much as we can. And if the apex is not in the, the field of view, then don't don't go into the black area. You just need to draw a straight line across it. Obviously, if we can't see it, we don't know where it is. And you know, that may be something that we need to then write in the comments that this is a technical limitation of, of, of that. So, uh, um, but I think uh, it, it's important that, that we try and, you know, uh, do a Simpsons where possible. But if you really can't do it, then let's not include it in a report because uh, it just drives that inter-observer variability a bit like Bob's comment about the LVOT. We want to try and be as consistent as we can. That's sort of the goal of, of the rounds and, and things moving forward. Great job, Vesna. Yeah. Thank you. So I think, you know, it's still one of our challenge. Uh, I'll just round up very quickly. One of the challenges actually um, trying to, um, you know, learn all the tracing. And I, I think, you know, at some point I would advocate uh, either Vesna or, or um, uh, our other echo fellows to do a tracing round. We'll figure out how to do this virtually or maybe in person. But uh, with that in mind, we'll close up today and let's sign off. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks, Vasna. Thank you. Please fill up your sur uh, survey. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.